Good evening and good morning to all of our participants and thank you so much for joining us uh, today for this important discussion focused on reducing methane emissions from abandoned coal mines. I think as we're waiting for people to trickle in, um, maybe I can start by introducing myself and then we can go over a few of the housekeeping announcements for this webinar. So my name is Nina Khanna and I am a re policy researcher at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab based in Berkeley, California. And I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator for today's discussion. Before we start, I'll just make a few brief housekeeping announcements for this webinar. We are recording this event and it will later be available on the California China Climate Institute website and YouTube channel. This event is also being simultaneously translated into Mandarin Chinese. Um, so if you're not familiar with Zoom, you can view the bottom face of your Zoom screen and you should be able to find a globe icon and you can use that to select your preferred language that you would like to listen in, whether it's English or a Mandarin, which is being translated. And throughout today's discussion, if you would like to ask a question for one of our panelists, we ask that you please type your question into the Q&A function at the base of your screen at any time. And we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can since we have so many experts with us and there's a lot of content to discuss and get through. So I will just wait maybe another two minutes to see if we have more participants joining and then we can begin. We can get started as people continue to join. Um, so diving right in, as we all know, methane is the second most abundant anthropogenic greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide. And reducing methane is especially important for helping mitigate climate change impacts in the near term. For today's discussion, we will be focusing on discussing reducing methane from abandoned coal mines. As both the United States and China are transitioning from coal, a large number of coal mines are being left abandoned. These abandoned mines are a significant source of methane emissions. The US and China are now taking actions to reduce methane emissions from abandoned coal mines, and both countries have significant opportunities to reduce their abandoned coal mine methane emissions over the next decade. And for today, the California China Climate Institute will introduce its latest report. Abandon coal mine methane reduction lessons from the United States. We also have the honor of having several experts in this field with us who will provide very valuable insights as well as information on how the US and China can reduce abandoned coal mine methane emissions. Thank you again for all thank you again for joining us today. And to get us started, I now have the opportunity and pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Zhang Lin to offer some opening remarks. Dr. Zhang Lin is the Nat Simons Presidential Chair in China Energy Policy at Lawrence Berkeley La National Lab and a staff scientist at the Department of Electricity, Market and Policy and an adjunct professor at the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Lin's research is focused on energy and climate policy, energy and emissions pathways with a focus on non-CO2 greenhouse gases, including methane, as well as electricity market and planning, low carbon economic transition and appliance efficiency issues in China. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lin. Thank you, Nina, for that nice introduction. And welcome to today's webinar on reducing methane emissions from abandoned coal mines. As you probably all know, methane is a short-lived climate um, pollutant with more than 80 times the warming impact of carbon dioxide over 20 years. Thus, reducing methane emissions is considered critical in limiting global temperature rise in the near term. Methane is estimated to be responsible for approximately 30% or today's anthropogenic warming already, taking targeted actions to reduce methane 
could avoid nearly 0.3 degrees Celsius warming by the 2040s, thus providing more time to adopt more ambitious action to reduce carbon emissions, which would take longer time to materialize. Globally, roughly 150 countries have signed up uh, to join the Global Methane Pledge with a goal of reducing global methane emission by 30% by 2030. The US and China has also affirmed their commitment to reducing methane emissions in their joint Glasgow Declaration uh, on Enhanced Climate Action in the 2020s. Most recently, methane was also mentioned as a potential area of collaboration in the most recent announcement between China and California that was assigned during Governor Newsom's recent trip to China. In terms of source of methane emissions, US and China have quite a different composition. You know, for example, in the US, uh, oil and gas uh, um, sector is the majority of the methane emission in, for the energy sector, while in China, coal mine is the leading source emission for the energy sector. In agriculture, US emissions dominated by enteric fermentation, while in China, rest cultivation accounts for a much larger share. Abandoned coal mine, as Nina mentioned, are a source of growing methane emissions in China as more and more coal mines are retired, but continue to emit methane emission, um, meth methanes. For example, there were roughly over 10,000 coal mines in the early 2010s, but now the number of coal mines has dropped to roughly about 5,000. Recent estimates suggest methane emission from abandoned coal mine in China accounts for roughly 6 to 10 percent of coal mine uh, of methane emission in total. Uh, so it is very timely today. We're having a webinar on how to reducing um, methane emissions in abandoned coal mines. I'm really looking forward to hear the presentation and the comments from our expert. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the insightful remarks to help us understand the global context as well as the US and China situation, Dr. Lin. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing a key author of this latest report, Yu Xinju, who will help us better understand the recent findings and the po key policy recommendations from the report. And with that, I'll introduce uh, Yu Xinju, who is a Methane Policy Fellow at the California China Climate Institute. He has worked on a broad range of environmental issues, such as methane control in China and air pollution. His areas of interest are methane emission reduction, China's decarbonization path, and the function of policy design in promoting sustainable economic development and climate change mitigation. Yuxing, over to you for your presentation. Uh, can you can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank thanks, Nina, for your introduction, and thank you, Dr. Lin, uh, for your opening remarks. Um, uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rishin Zhu. I'm the Methane Policy Fellow at the California China Climate Institute. Today, uh, I'm happy to give you a brief introduction to the latest report that the California China Climate Institute released called Abandoned Coal Mine Methane Reduction Lessons from the United States. Um, so before I dive in the content, uh, I would like to give you some background information about this report. Um, so first of all, why should we focus on methane? Um, as Dr. Lin and uh, Dr. Lin just mentioned, methane is an important greenhouse gases and is 80 times as potent as carbon dioxide at tripping, head, tripping heat in 10 to 20 years. Um, it accounts for 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions and reducing the thing could avoid nearly 0 0.3 Celsius degrees of global warming by the 2040s. So this is why we should focus on methane. Um, and the second question is why should we focus on abandoned coal mine methane? So uh, this is because as U.S. transitions from coal, uh, many, co many coal mines are left abandoned. Uh, this will have two impacts. One is that it will impact e the, e the economy of those communities that historically live on coal. 
And the other is that um, abandoned coal mines will continue to emit methane into the atmosphere. So abandoned coal mine, uh, coal mine methane uh, could be a great, could be the climate change problem that needs to be solved. And also abandoned mine methane could pose health hazards. According to data, uh, 330 thousand tons of methane uh, from abandoned coal mines was emitted into the atmosphere as of 2021, which accounts for 12.5% of all methane emissions from coal mining. So coal mining. Um, so that's why we should focus, we, we should try to address the problem of abandoned coal mine methane. And this will bring us some benefits such as addressing health risk, and uh, develop economy, e economy and uh, facilitate clean energy transitions as well. So let's switch our gears and talk more about the report. So this report uh, analyzed and summarized four major strategies that the US adopted to mitigate abandoned coal mine methane. Um, so first is modeling and monitoring. Uh, these strategies provide accurate information about specific abandoned coal mines and about um, how much methane is from abandoned mine, uh, is from abandoned coal mines uh, uh, you know, in the US. The second strategy is to implement abandoned mine methane mitigation and utilization projects. This can uh, help utilize abandoned mine methane as a clean energy source, which could facilitate clean energy tra transitions uh, in some states. The third strategy is interagency collaboration. Um, this can help enable coordinated efforts between various stakeholders and combine financial and technical resources from different um, agencies and stakeholders. Finally, the U.S. incorporates abandoned, coal, abandoned mine methane uh, mitigation in a broader policy framework to address problems around abandoned coal mines. Uh, I will talk more about that later, but um, for for now, um, I would like you to know that these strategies uh, do drive more investment to abandon mine methane mitigation and further address those problems around abandoned coal mines. So let's talk about the first strategies, uh, modeling and monitoring. So, so here you can see a diagram that explain that briefly ex explain how um, the modeling of abandoned mine methane works in the U.S. So in 1994, the EPA's launched a coal bed methane outage program, uh, which produced a U.S. abandoned mine methane estimation methodology. This methodology was integrated into IPCC 2006 inventory guidelines for abandoned mine methane estimation around the globe. And as we know, um, modeling requires uh, data as a foundation. Um, and in the U.S., there are two major sources of data that a major source of data that supports the abandoned mine methane estimation. There are EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program, GHGRP, and the Department of Labor's Mine Data Retrieval System, NDRS. Uh, so the GHGRP collects data of active coal mines emission rate, which is an important parameter for, aban uh, for abandoned mine methane modeling. And the MD MDRS provides mine by mine status data, um, for example, whether this mine is sealed, is flooded, uh, or whether there is mine, uh, or whether there is methane recovery project there, this, this, uh, all these different types of status will also affect methane emission rates from abandoned coal mines. Um, and the other part is monitoring. Um, so right now, the U.S. lacks a comprehensive national monitoring program for abandoned mine methane. But some states st uh, still try to monitor and quantify abandoned mine methane emissions for carbon trading purposes. Uh, an example is California. So California has a Kevin trade market, which include abandoned mine methane mitigation projects as an eligible source of uh, offsets credits. So in its protocol, California requires those projects to monitor the emission rates of abandoned mine methane and to report those data to governmental agencies. There are some still challenges uh, for modeling and monitoring abandoned mine methane in the US. Uh, for example, there is still insufficient data. Uh, this is because the, the several, the, there are several reasons for that. This uh, One is abandoned mines do not report emission data to EPA's GHGRP. 
Um, and also three important parameters uh, are not available for many abandoned mines. Uh, and finally, lack, uh, there's a lack of abandoned mine methane data at, a, at uh, abandoned mines without uh, utilization projects. So this, uh, co in combination, these three um, you know, reasons make it very hard to estimate abandoned mine methane accurately in the US. There are some potential solutions to this, though. Um, for example, we can develop a low detection threshold remote sensing technology. And in that way, we can use satellites to detect uh, methane emissions from abandoned coal mines. We can we should also rely, uh, we should also uh, invest more uh, in ground-based vehicle mounted methane detection systems. Uh, because these systems can provide more accurate data and size-specific data, which is really useful for abandoned mine methane modeling. The second strategy is that uh, U.S. adopted is to implement abandoned mine methane mitigation and utilization projects. So there was uh, two reasons for doing that. Well, first, um, there is large potential for uh, greenhouse gas mitigations from abandoned coal mines. In 2017, EPA identified 79 abandoned mine methane project opportunities. And according to our calculation, this project could reduce 2.7 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, or the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, 601,000 passengers vehicle in a year, which is which is um, which is a lot. So this so this is one reason. The second reason is uh, that the usage of abandoned mine methane could bring economic benefits. Uh, and there's various usage of abandoned mine methane, such as natural gas source, power generation, chemical feedstock, feedstock, et cetera. So that's why that's why uh, US, you know, put a lot of efforts in implementing abandoned mine methane mitigation and utilization projects. And here you can see a pie chart uh, demonstrating the status of uh, abandoned mine methane projects as of 2021. Um, so as you can see that right now there are 34 abandoned mine methane projects in the US uh, capture and utilizing 31.5% of total abandoned mine methane emissions. Uh, and as you can see in this pie chart, uh, most of the projects inject abandoned mine methane into natural gas pipelines because this is the most common commercial usage of abandoned mine methane. And you will also notice that a big proportion of these projects use flares to, de to destroy the abandoned mine methane. Uh, this is because sometimes the abandoned mine could be really rural and, uh, uh, and far from uh, infrastructure such as nat natural gas pipelines. So in this case, uh, extract abandoned mine methane and sell it to the market might not be economically feasible. And you and the only choice is to use flares to, de to destroy them so as to prevent greenhouse gas emissions. To better implement abandoned mine methane mitigation and utilization projects, uh, the US adopts both financial incentives and regulatory incentives to support these projects. So for financial incentives, there are governmental investments in infrastructure. Uh, one example is the 11 over 11 billion dollars found over 15 years after the passage of Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, and, that, uh, and also the Department of Interior announced nearly $725 million um, uh, with, with, with a goal to you know, mitigate abandoned mine methane. There are also market-based incentives. Uh, many voluntary carbon markets in the US allow abandoned mine methane projects to generate carbon credits. And also, as I mentioned before, California's cap and trade program uh, will offer offset credits to abandoned mine methane projects. And as of 2023, uh, the California Air Resource Board, CARB, uh, has already issued 3.69 million metric tons of offset credits to abandoned mine methane projects. Finally, royalty relief is also a type of financial incentive. Um, this, you know, according to a rule released by the Bureau of Land Management, um, the, the uh, a certain usage of abandoned mine methane uh, could be the, the royalty of certain usage of abandoned mine methane could be waived. Um, uh, and some states, such as Colorado, has already 
you know, have royalty relief mechanisms for to 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 encourage abandoned mine methane projects. There are also regulatory incentives, as I just mentioned. The most common regulatory incentive is to recognize abandoned mine methane as a renewable or alternative energy source. Um, five states already do that, um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Utah, Indiana, and Colorado. So basically, they include abandoned mine methane in their renewable portfolio standards uh, and allow electric and, and regard electricity from abandoned mine methane as renewable. Property rights, uh, very interesting, is also a regulatory incentive. Uh, here is a map. Uh, as you can see, uh, that the red dots represent each abandoned mine methane project in the U.S. as of 2021. And as you can see here, there are much more projects in the Eastern uh, America than the Western, than the Western America. Uh, one possible reason for this is because uh, in the eastern states, more coal mines are on private lands, which make it uh, relatively easy to acquire the permit to extract abandoned mine methane. On the contrary, on uh, in most uh, western states, uh, most coal mines are located on federal lands, which make it which make it more complicated to acquire extraction permits, and could in, and could uh, increase the expense uh, the legal expense uh, and extraction cost. So um, this so one one lesson from this map is that greater cl clarity around abandoned mine ownership and lease terms is a big driver for for more abandoned mine methane projects. The third strategy that U.S. takes is uh, implementing interagency collaboration. Um, so this is basically collab. So so there are many different. Uh, mechanics uh, inter interagency collaboration mechanisms in the U.S. and their their targets are similar, which is to um, leverage uh, knowledge and fi finance financial support from different sources and help uh, local communities. Uh, three that there are three examples that I think uh, worth to learn learn, learn from. Um, so the first is EPA's Cobalt Methane Courage Program which is a program between EPA and coal mining industry. This program will provide technical and financial guidance and help develop abandoned mine methane projects. It also provides lots of resources, uh, lots of models that could be used by coal mine owner to calculate, uh, to decide whether to extract abandoned mine methane or not. The second collaboration mechanisms uh, is the cabinet level methane task force introduced by the Biden administration in July this year. This is a government wide strategy for methane leak detection and uh, data transparency enhancement. Finally, we have the energy communities interagency working group. Uh, the target of this group is to facilitate coordination among uh, federal agencies and local communities. Uh, some some of its working progress include uh this includes involve more involving more than nine thousand stakeholders since its establishment, and conducting engagements in twenty six states, um so which is really impressive. Um, the final strategies that this paper focus on. Uh, is to incorporate abandoned mine methane mitigation in a broader policy framework. Um, to address problems around abandoned coal mines. So just to give you a little bit background, so usually after a coal mine was abandoned, uh, there, there will be some, there, there, there are two types of problems around it. So first is environmental and health hazards because uh, the closure of abandoned coal mines some uh, usually could lead to environmental pollution um, and safety issues. The second, the second problem around abandoned coal mine is economic impact because for those for those communities who historically live on coal mining, the closure of coal the closure of coal mines could um, you know decrease their revenue. So yeah, so revenue and abandoned mine methane projects happens to able to be able to solve these two problems. Um, so first, uh, as I just mentioned, abandoned coal Abandoned coal mine methane uh, projects can mitigate methane emissions, which can lower the risk of air pollution around abandoned coal mines. So that's why the U.S. incorporates abandoned mine methane projects 
uh, in a broader policy framework, uh, which in turn leads to more support for abandoned mine methane projects. And on the other hand, abandoned mine methane projects can drive clean energy transition, create jobs, and deliver economic benefits, in, uh, especially for those local communities. Um, as revitalizing community around abandoned coal mines remains a federal priority, uh, incorporating abandoned mine methane projects in a broader policy framework could uh, mean more support for abandoned mine methane projects. Um, and as we know now, more, more funding is available for abandoned mine methane projects under, under a broad, broader policy framework. So yeah, these are the four strategies that this paper focused on. Um, and just to give you a bit, little bit recap, uh, we talk about four best practices in the US that I think other countries can learn from. So first is abandoned mine methane estimation model development, uh, which help identify potential abandoned mine methane utilization opportunities. The second is continuous financial and fi uh, financial and regulatory support for abandoned mine methane utilization projects. Uh, and support these supports include governmental investment, carbon trading scheme, and renewal portfolio standards. Third, uh, collaboration among various stakeholders is important um, because it can help leverage multiple available financial and technical resources and help uh, provide site-specific solutions to local communities. Finally, uh, you finally uh, utilize utilizing abandoned mine methane projects to remediate abandoned coal mines could be the great solution to the problems around abandoned coal mines uh, because you know abandoned mine methane has multiple benefits and it can help achieve synergy between uh, economic, public health, and climate change mitigation. Um, finally, I would like to uh, give you some take-home messages. These are five major lessons that we learned from uh, summarizing U.S. experience in, mit in mitigating abandoned mine methane. So first, a comprehensive uh, abandoned mine methane policy package should include investment regulation, financial incentive, and collaboration framework. Second, uh, continuous investment in uh, abandoned mine methane projects and monitoring, te monitoring technology are crucial. And speaking of, speaking of monitoring technology, uh, low detection thresholds, remote sensing, and ground-based vehicle-mounted uh, sensing equipment are two directions for in innovation in the future. Third, uh, regulatory barriers to developing abandoned mine methane projects can be addressed through both regulatory and leg legislative approaches. Market-based financial incentives are also important. Um, examples of um, the so-called regulatory and leg legislative, legislative approaches uh, include a clear procedure about acquiring abandoned mine methane extraction permits, uh, clear law about property rights, clear law about uh, property right transfer, something like that. Next, uh, collaboration among different stakeholders uh, and direct engagement with communities are important because it can help ensure that local communities really benefit from this abandoned mine methane project. Finally, um, it is a good idea to in integrate abandoned mine methane uh, mitigation and utilization into a broader framework for abandoned coal mines because abandoned mine, methane, abandoned mine methane projects has multiple benefits and these benefits are aligned with the goal of abandoned coal mine remediation. So that's, that, that is something that other countries could consider when they design their own policies. So that's all about this report. Um, and if you are interested, you can go to this link and check out our reports for more details. We also have uh, two versions. Uh, we also have an executive summary um, in both English and Chinese. Um, so yeah, I hope you can check that out. And I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Zixing. I really appreciate the perspectives and insights you shared with us and also walking us through the four best practice strategies from the U.S. experience, as well as those 
summary of lessons learned. And I noted that we do have some co questions coming in, but I think we'll save it for the Q&A portion and some of those questions might be addressed uh, in our next segment as well. So with that, I am pleased now to also introduce other leading experts that we're very fortunate to have join us tonight and this morning on this topic who will offer their commentary to this report and also share some of the best practices in abandoned coal mine methane mitigation from their own experiences and perspectives. I'll begin by introducing each expert initially, and then we'll be able to hear each of their remarks. So first, we have Mr. Jeff Coronado from the California Air Resources Board. He brings over a decade of expertise as an environmental econ economist and policymaker. He has served as part of the California Air Resources Board's cap and trade program and leads on several compliance offset protocols, including mine methane capture, livestock, and rice. And Mr. Coronado has been with CARB since 2013 and previously worked at the California Environmental Protection Agency Department of Toxic Substance Control. And then after Jeff, we'll have Dr. Pamela Franklin, who leads the non-CO2 programs branch in the Climate Change Division at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. She leads domestic and international public-private partnerships focused on methane mitigation and started her career at EPA leading the COBET Methane Outreach Program. Dr. Franklin earned her PhD from the Energy and Resources Group here at the University of California, Berkeley. And lastly, we'll have Dr. Xiaonan Zhang, who is the Manager for Energy Methane at Environmental Defense Fund or EDF China office. Dr. Zhang has been working in the field of renewable energy and low carbon emission reduction for a long time and has many years of experience in carbon, op in carbon asset management and CCUS. And as a reminder to our audience, if you have a question for any of our panelists during their remarks, please enter it in the Q&A section at the base of the screen, and we'll discuss those at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff for his remarks. Hello, thank you for having me, and good morning and good evening to everybody. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I could, uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, yeah, I was asked to look at the report and uh, give a little presentation on the implementation. Uh, there's so much to go over, so I, I kind of try to condense it down. So I'm going to start with the, uh, the uh, some comments on the report, the modeling and monitoring. Um, when it comes to the implementation, uh, right, the detail is very important. Uh, example is uh, current and up-to-date compliance status or any enforcement actions, because if there's an enforcement action at a project, folks cannot collect their credits when they're out of compliance. <clears throat> and so uh, going back to the last presentation, I just made a note, um, clear law uh, about inquiring about uh, ownership of mines or regulations out here, each state is, um, or each area is um, regulated by the uh, Mine Safety and Health Administration. And so each one has, uh, um, each one is a bit different. So you have to first find out who to talk to first. Um, the next one would be uh, mitigation and utilization. So for the offsets program, a hole that had pipeline injection would not be eligible to participate in the offsets program. And the reason is, is because it has to be additional. It has to, um, it, 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 pipeline injection is a, is a common practice. So it, it wouldn't be eligible to participate in the offsets program. Uh, regulatory incentives uh, speak to the rights of the mine. Uh, as far as uh, air resources board, we, we have taken the position that the project that receives a verification statement that results in issuance has the right to the offsets associated with the corresponding mine safety and health administration identification number. This identification number says what the mine is, whether it's abandoned, uh, abandoned and sealed, active and so on. 
So this identification number is needed to determine what's called the decline curve for the abandoned methane project, which is the baseline. And this cannot be shared and it cannot be split up between projects. So the protocol does not allow for the sharing of a, of a baseline for an abandoned mine project, which is really important to know. Let's see, uh, conclude. Um, far as uh, the implementation part, um, CARB, uh, California Air Resources Board, we're very committed to prioritizing environmental justice in everything we do. So there's a lot of engagement with the community members uh, to provide them with the best possible information and to answer any questions. Webinars, press, uh, we're just, we're an open book. So we we welcome questions and input. We need, we need the community to be involved. Um, slide two, please. Perfect. Um, CARB is committed to uh, la, 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 la. Oh, cap and trade. It, it's a market-based regulation uh, that is designed to reduce greenhouse gases from multiple sources and is one of a suit uh, um, of measures under the AB, AB 32 Act, uh, including we have advanced clean cars, energy efficiency standards, water use efficiency standards, green buildings, and high global warming potential gas measures. Uh, the cap and trade, just give you a little background, sets a firm limit or cap on GH, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to minimize the compliance costs of achieving, achieving AB 32 goals. Uh, participants are allowed to trade two types of compliance in instruments, uh, allowances, and offsets, which allows for flexibility. Uh, slide three, please. Thank you so much. Um, offsets. Uh, offsets are a tradable credit that represent verified greenhouse gas emission reductions or enhanced sequestration in sectors or sources not covered under the cap. So although the offset project is not itself covered under the cap, it can generate reductions for use by entities who must comply with the regulation. Slide four, please. The compliance offset program is an important cost containment element within the broader cap and trade program. Entities may use up to 4% offsets for compliance in the cap and trade program. Uh, it's going to move to 6% uh, starting in 2026. No more than one half of the quantitative usage limit may be sourced from projects that do not provide direct environmental benefit to the state of California. Next slide, please. So this map shows which states have mine methane projects. Uh, most are coal producing, but we do have one Trona mine in Wyoming. Uh, currently, mine methane projects account for about 5% of the total offsets issued. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the offsets must meet the criteria of AB 32, and the definitions are in Section 95802 of our cap and trade regulations. That's being real. I usually say the definitions, but for the sake of time, you could just look them up. Uh, real, additional, quantifiable, permanent, verifiable, and enforceable. Uh, the one that we check, or the one that I think should stick out is the additional. Now, in the means, in the context of offset credits, G, uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions or removals that exceed any greenhouse gas reductions or removals otherwise required by law, regulation, or legally binding mandate, and that exceeds any greenhouse gas reductions or removals that would otherwise occur in a conservative business as usual scenario. The credits must result from board adopted compliance offset protocols, which I'll show you a link, a link to all these at the end. Uh, GHG emission reductions activities already covered under the cap are not eligible for ARB offset credits, such as energy efficiency programs uh, and fuel switching. Next slide, please, slide seven. 
Thank you. Uh, all compliance offset projects must be determined to be in conformance with all state, federal, and local environmental health and safety regulation uh, regulations applicable to the offset project uh, project's location before the Air Resources Board will issue Air Resources Board offset credits. Uh, if the project is out of regulatory compliance, uh, if the project activities were subject to enforcement action by a regulatory offsite offsite oversight body, excuse me, during the reporting period. Such a project will not be eligible to receive offset credits for the time the report for the time during the reporting period it is out of compliance. Uh, for more of this information, you can see our guidance on regulatory conformance and invalidation located on the Air Resources Board Compliance Offset Program webpage. Next slide, please. Slide eight. For uh, monitoring and reporting deadlines, uh, monitoring and reporting are required. Uh, the offset project data report due for every reporting period. Uh, subsequently, they have to be uh, 12 months and there is no break allowed in uh, reporting. Reporting is continuous. Um, there are an exception. The first reporting period can be six to 24 months. And the last reporting period in a crediting period, which is 10 reporting periods, can uh, can be less than 12 months, but only in the case if you're switching to the low carbon fuel standard. And uh, last slide, please, slide nine. Thank you. Uh, verification. Uh, the offset project operator or authorized project designee must obtain the services of an Air Resources Board accredited offset verification body for each reporting period. No more than six consecutive reporting periods may be verified by the same verification body or verification team members, except for reforestation or urban forest projects which defer verification for up to 12 years. At least three consecutive reporting periods must be verified by a different verification body before the previous verification body can verify the project again. The verifier must submit the notice of offset verification services at least 30 days prior to commencing offset verification services. And these verification bodies must also submit a conflict of interest document. The offset project registry we have three registries right now, will make an issuance determination within 45 days of receiving the offset verification statement and all necessary information from offset project operators. Once an offset project registry has issued registry offset credits, Air Resources Board will review all the information that was submitted and then ARB will make a determination within 45 days of receiving complete information if the greenhouse gas emission reductions and removal enhancements meet regulatory requirements and are eligible to receive Air Resource Board offset credits. Last slide, please. Now I put these links up uh, the first one is my information. You're more than welcome to contact me anytime with any questions or, or anything like that or information. And then the next is the Compliance Offset Program page. Anything you want to know about offset compliance programs, it's all right here. I also uh, gave a link to the protocols. We have six different ones and the cap and trade regulations which are very important. And then at the very bottom, there's an ARB offset issuance map. You can see on the map where every project is. And then lastly, I didn't put in here, there is on the bottom of the page, a webinar that has me speaking to each slide and it covers the whole implementation from listing to issuance um, in, a, in a webinar and it's all recorded. So please, if you get a chance, take a look at our website. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, contact us. Thank you very much. Oh, and go bears. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for introducing the different elements of the compliance offset protocol for my 
methane capture in California. And now we're going to zoom out a little bit to the U.S. national level. And I have the pleasure of turning it over to Dr. Pamela Franklin from the U.S. EPA for her remarks. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you see my screen? No, not yet. We only see okay. your video. Okay. It's Can you see it now? now? Yes, now we see it. Yes. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. It's truly an honor to be here speaking with you all and to be part of this distinguished panel um, and for the opportunity to speak about this exciting report. Um, we're really, um, on behalf of EPA and the COVID Methane Outreach Program, very excited to see attention being paid to abandoned mine methane. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to that. Uh, let's see. All right, having some technical difficulties advancing the slide. Um, okay. Um, so I just wanted to zoom out and and just provide a little bit of perspective from the EPA's um, perspective on on abandonment methane and. Um, this has already been touched upon um, earlier, but just to emphasize, methane is a really important greenhouse gas. Um, it's about 11.5% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2021. And when you look at the key sources of that methane, of anthropogenic man-made methane in the U.S., um, the key sources, oil and gas, enteric fermentation, landfills, manure management, and coal mining, um, which is uh, currently about 6%. And that is declining um, back when I started EPA um, almost 20 years ago, um, methane, well, coal mine methane was a, a significantly bigger percentage of U.S. total methane emissions. Let's see if I can get this to go to the next slide. Uh, so this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, has really been extremely active in addressing uh, methane um, emissions across the board from multiple sectors um, and has launched a suite of different efforts to address methane emissions, um, including in 2021, a White House methane emission reduction action plan um, and has provided historic levels of investment uh, to address methane emissions, um, including through the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes a very large provision called the Methane Emission Reduction Program, um, most of that is focused on oil and gas, but it just signifies the broad um, intent to address methane. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of regulatory effort in landfill and oil and gas sectors. Um, there's been a, a great attention to the greenhouse gas reporting program and continued support for voluntary program efforts, um, including in the coal mining sector. And I'll touch upon this at the very end as well, but um, it's not just domestic efforts, but EPA and the rest of the administration is really also focused on how do we fit in with the world and how can we support global efforts through um, actions such as the global, global Methane Pledge that was launched in 2021, um, as well as ongoing efforts through the Global Methane Initiative, which has been going on for about 20 years as well. Um, and so we'll speak a little bit about that at the very, very end. Um, I'll just speak for a moment about the coal bed methane outreach program, uh, which was mentioned in the context of this report. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. It was the first place that I worked when I uh, joined EPA um, back in the day. It's been around for um, nearly 30 years, and it's um, a partnership program, a voluntary program. So it works um, to help uh, companies and um, technology providers and state and local um, groups to identify the low-hanging fruit, to identify ways that they can reduce their um, mine, mine methane emissions um, cost-effectively. And so it's really focused, despite its name, uh, which is a little bit confusing, it's really focused on the coal mine methane. So what are the emissions uh, from, from the act of mining and post-mining? So the abandoned mines fit into that schema. And so... Um, when we're talking about abandoned mines, just recognizing that of the 6% uh, that coal mining constitutes of total US methane emissions, abandoned mines are about 13% of that total. Um, and so when you look at the, the biggest sources from coal mining in general, um, it's from the active underground 
coal mines, those ventilation systems. But the abandoned mine methane is, is an important and significant source. So we do want to take a look at that. And as was pointed out, you know, the it's very important to uh, make sure that we're tracking what those emissions are um, and we don't have direct reporting from the about uh, abandoned mine methane emissions or direct measurement of those mines um, to EPA. So we have to use a variety of uh, modeling efforts and, and in particular looking at um, the last known emissions uh, from the mines at the time that they were active before they were abandoned in order to uh, model and assess uh, what the emissions are uh, from those abandoned mines um, across the U.S. And so just a few words about kind of the context um, in the U.S. for our abandoned underground coal mines. There are thousands of them and the numbers are growing um, as, um, as mines are shut down. Um, but uh, mining has been going on in the U.S. for a couple hundred years. And so there's many out there that are um, not necessarily known how much they're they're emitting into the atmosphere. Um, we we uh, meaning EPA meaning the coal bed methane outreach program has looked at, um, at the the mines of which we're aware. We do have a database of coal of abandoned coal mines um, and a, and a really uh, useful interactive map. Um, but we estimate that fewer than of about a hundred of which we're aware um, have the potential for sufficient methane resources um, to make a viable um, methane recovery and use project from a, a technical perspective and from a cost-effective perspective as well. Um, and just to acknowledge that um, it's not always easy to uh, mitigate these abandoned coal mines. Um, as was mentioned earlier, many of them are located in very rural areas um, that could be very far from infrastructure or uh, potential energy customers. So figuring out what to do uh, with that methane. And in fact, many of these mines are also flooded, so that prevents the methane recovery um, of the mines, it makes that number of, of mines that have viable methane emissions um, relatively small. Um, it is important to note though, but because the mines are no longer active, they're no longer uh, being regulated by the Mine Safety and Health Administration. There's no longer workers in the area to be concerned about the safety of, of their well being. So, um, in some ways, the recovery projects are simpler to implement than mines at, uh, than, than projects at active mines. Um, and it does present an opportunity for um, a number of different end uses, you know, depending on what type of environment they're, they're near. Um, so just to provide a, um, some over, overview of the, the various policies related to abandoned mine methane, and I just wanted to acknowledge, um, I thought that the report did a really um, nice job of providing um, a number of, you know, ways in which the U.S. Um, has uh, different layers, if you will, different layers of engagement um, and incentives and regulations that all uh, help encourage um, the recovery and use of abandoned mine methane. And from my perspective, what, what emerged from that report was a really interesting message that, um, in, especially in the U.S., it's really not a single policy or a single regulation that has led to the outcome where we're, we're doing a pretty good job of reducing methane from abandoned mines, and we could do a better job, but it's rather an all-of-the-above approach um, that we have some, some federal policies, we have some state-level policies that are really providing strong incentives at the state level. Um, we have some regulations and some regulatory policies, but we also have a lot of market-based approaches. Um, we also have an acknowledgement that it's very difficult to get the right data and to be really precise in the emissions, but that doesn't mean that one can't um, make an impact on emissions reductions um, by recovering and using the methane. Um, and similarly, um, it's not just about the methane reduction. Um, I come from the climate change division. We care a lot about methane reduction uh, because it's an important greenhouse gas, but we also acknowledge every time you do a project that's helping to remediate um, an abandoned mine, you're also providing a lot of other um, benefits, environmental health, safety, um, and economic benefits as well. Um, so just wanna acknowledge that there's a lot of uh, different levels at which um, the levers are being pulled to advanced coal mi abandoned mine methane um, mitigation. Um, so it, including at the federal level, the Department of Interior has been given um, a tremendous amount of resources through the bipartisan infrastructure law 
Um, and uh, they just announced this year $725 million is going to be going to tribes and states. Um, and that's going to be helping to reclaim abandoned coal mines. So that's an example of a really um, big, uh, big federal action. Um, it was also mentioned that this idea of legal ownership of methane, um, it gets to the challenges of mitigating the projects um, and the clarity that is needed in order to help facilitate these projects. Um, so it ironically in the private lands that, that happen to be in the Eastern United States, um, the, the ownership rights are typically a little bit more clear cut. Uh, on the federal lands, there are often different owners of the uh, gas estate and the coal estate. Um, and so determining who has the rights um, can be challenging. And there's also royalties that are due to the federal government um, if it's on, on federal land, and that can make the economics of the project more challenging. Um, and then as we mentioned at the state level, uh, there are some really exciting um, incentives. Um, you just heard about all about the California Air Resources Board program, um, but that has proven to be a great big driver for, for these types of projects. Um, and other states have, um, I know there were some comments and questions in the chat about renewable energy. Um, regardless of what these states call them, it's an incentive for um, abandoned mine methane to be recovered um, from, from these states. Let's see, so um, just an overview of, uh, uh, this is a, a map that we have on our uh, website for the coal bed methane outreach program, um, just showing um, that you can take a look in more detail at the mines that are um, involved in methane mitigation projects. Um, and you can see that we've, according to our count, you know, there's about 35 projects that collect gas from uh, about 66 different abandoned mines. The most common end uses are flaring, which is typically associated with a offset project or um, selling the gas to natural gas pipelines. Um, and some additional resources that we have at the in the coal bed methane outreach program, um, we mentioned the map. Um, that's interactive and you can sort for not just abandoned mines, but all different kinds of uh, mine opportunities and ongoing projects. Uh, we have a number of reports. Uh, we have a database um, of abandoned mine methane um, opportunities that does need to be updated. It's a few years old. Um, and we have a detailed uh, methodology and some, some trainings available. So I encourage you to look at some of our resources. Um, and I just wanted to close by saying a word about our international engagement. Um, the Global Methane Initiative was launched back in 2004, and it's a public-private partnership, so it involves uh, now 47 partner countries, including China, um, and it, it focuses on methane mitigation across uh, five different sectors, including coal mining, and it's intended to be um, an opportunity for information sharing and um, collaboration uh, between uh, partner countries and with the private sector to really um, talk about getting the pipeline of projects um, identified and, and get the mitigation where we can. And I'll say that uh, China has been a very strong supporter and active engaged uh, leader of the Global Methane Initiative. They are uh, one of the co-leaders of the coal mine subcommittee along with the US and India and have been incredibly active and have um, just implemented any a very large number of projects um, in the coal mine sector um, and have been able to share a lot of those success stories uh, with the US and with other countries as well. So just want to share that we are really proud of the work that we've we've done over the years to um, achieve methane emission reductions um, through this sharing and through these um, different types of training and, and resources that we've provided uh, to our partner countries and encourage you all to um, take a look at the um, the Global Methane Initiative uh, website, um, and um, we look. We are having a big meeting in Geneva in uh, March 2024, and encourage you to uh, to join us for that meeting. Um, and I keep going the wrong direction. Uh, I'm at my end of my remarks. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here. Xie xie. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela, for sharing the. U.S. experience as well as the international engagement aspects. Um, and I know we're running a little bit behind schedule, but we do have one more panelist and hopefully we'll still be able to get to some of your questions. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Xiaonan Zhang from EDF for her remarks. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. 
and I'm Xiao Nan Zhang from the Environmental Defense Fund. And uh, well, firstly, I want to say that uh, uh, this report is write, uh, written in great detail and uh, summarize a lot of valuable uh, experience for the references. Uh, I will uh, refer back to the report during my presentation. Uh, please, if you could uh, just uh, share my presentation here. Hello, hi, sorry. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me? The yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I will uh give a brief uh introduction about the current uh, status and the policies of the abandoned coal mine management in the China in China. And next next slide, please. Yeah, um, in China we have our uh, main provinces where where the coal mine were closed, uh, such as Shanxi province in the Mongolia, uh, Henan, Henan province, and uh, uh, Sichuan, Guizhou, and Yunnan province. But uh, the uh, the location, uh, the different provinces have different situation, uh, such as the Shanxi province in the Mongolia and Henan province. The coal mine that do not satisfy the safety and environmental standards. Or having been mined out, uh, those coal mines have been closed. And but uh, for the Sichuan, Guizhou, and the Yunnan province, the coal mine have been closed because uh, the coal mine is with a lower uh, average capacity. Uh, next, please. So uh, we we have a little bit uh, small calculation. The number of the uh, largest number of the uh, coal mine closed was in the. Uh, 2016. We can see the uh, <clears throat> we can see the uh, pictures uh, on the left, and uh, which is related to the mo <clears throat> modernization of the China's energy transition strategy. Uh, we like draw drive away from the coal uh, traditional coal energy supply. Next, please. And uh. uh as the report mentioned as well, the policy has most impact on the abandoned coal mine management in China. Since most of the coal company cannot make long-term planning for the development and the utilization of the abandoned coal mine without any um, promising uh, uh, profit. Next, please. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, but uh, we still have some policies uh, related to the uh, coal mine method utilization, uh, such as uh, we have uh, uh, one from the um, <clears throat> we have the one from the uh, comments from the con uh, state council on the coal industry or capacity resolution to achieve breakthrough. Uh, start from the 2016, a period of three to five years will be used to quit another 5 million tons of production capacity, which is uh, the government will offer the uh, financial support, create new employment uh, opportunities, increase financial support, and uh, revitalize uh, land res resources and uh, technological transformation is encouraged as well. Next, please. And, uh, 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 from the uh, from the uh, CP CPPCC, and uh, we also have uh, uh like uh comments, and we will have a, a issue a serious tax policy to promote a focus on the resource uh utilization of the natural source, and uh, more relevant uh, uh policy will be released uh, soon, in uh which comments in, is given in the, in the two thousand two thousand. Right. Next, please. And the government has issued a number of uh, incentive uh, policies to support and encourage coal mine enterprises to extract and uh, utilize the coal coal bed method, uh, which uh, the, they are all uh, from the 2016, 2000, uh, 2006, 2007. So uh, we can see we have a long uh, history to use uh, to use to develop to develop the technology to use the coal mine method. In addition, uh, the policy has been issued to support the coal mine method in terms of prices, fees, financial benefits, taxes, 
And more, more detail uh, we expect about the uh, China's plan to estimate, monitor, and uh, utilize abandoned coal mine. Uh, expected in the National Action Plan, as we all know, may be uh, probably released uh, before the uh, COP28, which will be a promise, uh, promising, uh, uh, like an encourage uh, uh, document uh, for the China's methane, uh, methane uh, reduction. Next, next slide, please. And uh, we all notice the international exchange is very important for the uh, methane emission reduction for the uh, abandoned coal mine. China is in the very early stage of the methane emission reduction from this uh, abandoned coal mine. And the uh, specific implementation method still need to be explored and improved. However, China's technology for uh, utilization the uh, methane in coal mines relatively um, mature. And uh, uh, meanwhile, the U.S. has years of experience in closing coal mines and uh, managing abandoned coal mines. And its advanced uh, technology and policy making can provide ideas for the uh, methane emission reductions. So uh, even though the China has advanced technology to uh, for the uh, coal mine utilization, however, as this report mentioned, uh, the insufficient, insufficient, uh, insufficient uh, data makes it uh, impossible to uh, accurately estimate the abandoned coal mine emission in China as well. So, uh, uh, sorry, next please. So because we realize the uh, we realize the science-based data is crucial to the uh, policymakers to evaluate how to develop a comprehensive policy package for the abandoned coal mine. Uh, we EDF have promoting the establish establishment of the MRV system for national and subnational level, which is uh, the foundation of the method mitigation of the abandoned coal mine. Next, please. Thank you. And so this year, together with the Administrative uh, Center for the China China's Agenda 21, uh, we launched the China-US Track to Method Science and the Technology uh, Collaboration uh, Platform, and uh, we, uh, to uh, uh, to <clears throat> facilitate uh, collaboration and uh, the exchange among top method science and research expert in both countries. Uh, for uh, the two uh, seminars we have been uh, held, we have been held. Uh, we discussed the, the um, method uh, satellite remote sensing monitoring and the uh, uh, quantifications. Next, please. And uh, um, so we have some recommendation for the uh, future development of the abandoned coma management in China. Firstly, we think uh, is uh, important to building the full life cycle management of the abandoned mine. There is still a lack of awareness of advanced management planning for coal mine in China. Awareness building is essential for the mass reduction in abandoned coal mine. And also we should issue legislation on the mass management in coal mine in abandoned mine. Management of the abandoned mine is long-term and difficult. It requires high priority at the national level to like promote the uh, policy package to support it. And, the, and also it's very important to introduce in financial support for the development and the utilization of the abandoned coal mine. Abandoned coal mine cost more to manage than regular coal mine. So the uh, financial instruments will promote mass uh, reduction in abandoned coal mine. Uh, according to the report uh, we mentioned this morning, the California's uh, cap and treat uh, program included the abandoned coal mine project as a source of the GHG offset. Since China's uh, voluntary uh, carbon market is reopened uh, this, uh, this year, uh, we believe it's good to have the CCER methodology also for the abandoned coal mine project soon as well in China. 
So, and uh, the most important thing uh, we think is uh, is also to establish in the MRV system and the pilot project for the methane emission reduction from the coal mine, uh, abandoned coal mine. Uh, the, select, uh, the select advanced technology and the reliable and the econ uh, economically feasible project for demonstration to promote the pro uh, progress of the abandoned coal mine management in China, which is to get the better and the enough data to support the policy package. And last, uh, we think uh, the setting up the effective uh, joint mechanism is also important. The international technology and the policy sharing in the mass management in abandoned coal mine is beneficial. And uh, uh, NGOs like RSEDF will play an important role in it. Uh, so, uh, and the last I want to uh, mention that is as well is in this uh, report, uh, this report is also brought a very important concept to recognize the abandoned coal mine method is a clean energy and not a, a pollutant or a, a contaminant, which is very important because it can really bring the benefit to the local community and also the uh, energy companies. So um, thank you very much is all my uh, sharing today. And uh, next, uh, the last slide, please, thank you. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please uh, email me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much to Dr. Uh, Xiaonan Zhang for sharing the latest developments in China in this area, and also to all of our experts for sharing your different perspectives and commentary. And I noted that we had two questions in the Q&A, but I think in the course of the remarks, um, particularly with uh, Dr. Pamela Franklin, uh, also Dr. Xiaonan Zhang's remarks, I hope we were able to answer those regarding you know, why AMM utilization is considered a clean energy by some states in the US, as well as some of the broader kind of co-benefits of AMM utilization. Um, to community as well as economic benefits. Um, but I welcome our panelists to also add anything else in the Q&A section if they wanna offer additional answers. Um, but given, I think that we're running about five minutes late, um, I think at this point, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Xiaopu Sun to offer some closing remarks for today's discussion. Ms. Xiaopu Sun is Senior China Counsel at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. She has over a decade of experience working on advancing the reduction of short-lived climate pollutants, including methane, through regulatory measures and incentives, as well as international mechanisms. So Ms. Sun, over to you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you also to all the speakers today for the very informative presentations. Um, some key takeaways from today include that cutting methane emissions is critical for slowing near-term warming. Additionally, methane mitigation in the coal mining sector provides coal benefits for public health and environmental quality. Um, therefore, it is of great value to facilitate knowledge sharing sessions like today's webinar, which really covers the key aspects for the development and strengthening of and effective method mitigation policy framework. Um, I believe this is also a very timely conversation uh, in the run up to the APEC leaders meeting in San Francisco and COP28 of the UNFCCC. With that, I very much look forward to further progresses and communications on method mitigation collaborations at both the national and subnational levels during these um, upcoming action forging events. Um, thank you all very much. Um, that's all. I'll give the floor back to Nina. Thank you so much, Ms. Sun. And thank you so much to all of our panelists, as well as our audience from joining at different time zones from across the world for this discussion. And we hope that you found it very useful and insightful as I have. So this discussion has been recorded and will later be available on the California China Climate Institute's website as well as its YouTube channel. And again, a deep thank you to all of our panelists as well as to our audience members for joining us today. This concludes our webinar and I hope everyone has a great evening as well as a great morning. Thank you.